This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm Patrick Gulo. I'm Sam Mercier's. I'm Dave McDonald. And I'm Nate Blyton. This week, we're happy to be joined by Missy Mazzoli. Missy is recently the recipient of the Detroit Symphony's Elaine Lindenbaum Memorial Award. Her music has also been performed by the American Composers Orchestra, Kronos Quartet, Eighth Blackbird, and countless others. Missy, thanks for being on the show this week. Thanks for having me. So tell us about this award you just won. This is kind of a big deal, right? Yeah, for me, it definitely is a big deal. Um, every year, I, I think it's every year, the Detroit Symphony um, holds a contest for female composers. And um, they offer a $10,000 commission and um, they premiere a new piece, a new orchestral work. And um, I was really, really thrilled to get this because I love Detroit. I think Detroit is a fascinating rich, amazing place um, right now. Mm -hmm. And I really wanted to do something artistic there and this sort of came up at the same time. So it's, it's great. Yeah. So um, I have a question uh, actually uh, before we move on from that. Mm -hmm. um, you, you said that you find Detroit to be a, f a fascinating city. I'm curious, we're, the, <laughs> the, the four of us uh, all went to graduate school in Michigan and have spent a uh -huh. good deal of time in Detroit. I'm curious as to what fascinates you about Detroit. <laughs> Not that there's well, nothing fascinating about Detroit. I'm curious about what p particular fascinates you. Yeah. yeah, well, um, you know, I haven't, I've only been there twice. You probably spent a lot more time there than I have. But my band went there on tour um, last summer and we played in a venue called um, Cade, uh, Contemporary Art Institute of Detroit, which sounds a lot more, it makes it, the, it sound a lot bigger than it actually is. It's this venue, um, it's sort of like an abandoned lot and then this sort of amazing oh, yeah. art gallery. On I this, think it, is it, play is it the, Cade yeah. now? I guess so. Cade, okay. yeah. Cool. And, um, and so, and we have, you know, so we played this show and just, it, what was really fascinating was just talking to all these kids who came to the show. I and mean, we've never, before or since played a more um, interesting or diverse to more interesting or diverse audience. Like the, there were, you know, young 16 year old, like punked out teenagers and then like older hip hop fans who were actually there for the band that was going to be on after us, but stayed to hear us and were really like excited and, and appreciative. And people were just very vocal and, um, in saying what they thought about the music, which is, it was mostly all really good. And we we're really just excited about it. I mean, it was just a completely, I don't know how else to, to say it because it was just a completely different experience from playing a show in New York or really anywhere else that we've ever played in our entire life as a band. Um, and we, you know, they also called, go ahead. Go ahead. Go, I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, they also call Detroit um, the sixth borough. <laughs> Sometimes they call Philly the sixth borough of New York. But I think now a lot of friends of mine are, are moving to Detroit um, or are talking about moving to Detroit. Cool. Um, and I just, I just loved it. I, I absolutely loved it. That's really cool. Yeah. Go ahead, Sam. Well, you might be catching, the vibe you might be catching in Detroit is, to me, they seem to have a very strong uh, sense of community as far as music. There's a lot of homegrown music that people that actually live there follow and listen to that might not ever get distributed beyond the Detroit area. Right, and they're really proud of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're very proud. Of it. And, yeah, of course, everybody oh, yeah. has a strong electronic music history there, um, which I don't know what your band sounds like exactly but based on the piece we're going to listen to i'm guessing that there's some electronic stuff going on so there are there are a lot of electronics in my band um you know also violin clarinet two keyboards um upright bass mm -hmm. um and but you know it, it's, it's interesting because with that show in detroit we were opening for this band lord scrummage mm -hmm. um which is sort of like synthy pop crazy almost like psychedelic they were absolutely amazing and they had this huge following in Detroit and um, this really dedicated group of fans and they were so cool like we crashed on their couch yeah. you know it was just this sort of like yes you're in in the club and you're just we don't know you at all but just come to Detroit and and sleep on our floor and it'll be fine That's cool. <laughs> so we loved That's cool. that we loved that feeling and you don't get that everywhere yeah. and it was really it was very cool do you plan on doing more stuff in Detroit 
I would love to. I mean, I really, I'm excited that the symphony sort of survived the, the strike and that it, in surviving, they seem to have a lot of good ideas about um, expanding their programming to include um, a bunch of different theaters and venues in Detroit and, and a lot of, I feel like they're very open-minded. So I would love to, you know, curate concerts there or um, play more shows with my band and connect with local artists. Um, so yeah, it's in the very early stages, but I'm really, um, I'm really excited about the possibilities. Cool. Yeah, having really a piece cool. played in Detroit at this point would be cool because to me, the Detroit, uh, at least the orchestra, is like the middle-aged guy who survives a heart attack and learns how to love life again, you know? Because <laughs> they were pretty yeah. close, they were close to the edge and they made it, so they, they have a deeper appreciation of what they got now, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you know, I don't know, I, I haven't spoken to really anybody in the orchestra about it, so I don't want to speak for them and say that they that it's, they have this new lease on life. But just from an outsider's perspective, I'm just excited that they're there and excited that they're commissioning new work. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it kind of could, anything could happen now. That's an exciting place to be. Yeah, absolutely. All right, is Yuji Wong's dress too short? <laughs> too short for who? I don't know. It's too a blue hair, apparently. Volleyball? Yes. For what? Wait, hold on. For volleyball? <laughs> yes, too short for volleyball. <laughs> so um, let's, let's, let's catch up for a second. Let, 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 Patrick, what are you talking about? <laughs> so recently, Yuji Wong has gotten this criticism online. In that Yuji Wong, we all know, is a pianist. She's been making waves for a little while now. Um, she's very technically proficient, great at what she does, um, but she wear some skimpy outfits and she's kind of bringing this this uh i don't know this sexual kind of aura to classical music that a lot of um you know snuffy nosed people don't like and so there's this big debate happening online right now and Anne Majette wrote a big article about it for the Washington Post and on her blog um so i mean some some people are kind of a against it but i think most people are are say you know wear whatever you'd like especially in the year 2011 you know i don't know what people are so uptight about what do you guys think well i mean so there's, there's a lot of different there things you have to it. think yeah a lot of... it's so i mean there's it, it, mid it, it, midget is that how we're saying her name i don't know how yeah, to say her name midget okay. yeah that's it all right, so uh, she she writes a, a few interesting things in her article, uh, and one of them is that this is always there for a long time. This has been an issue for female performers in classical music um, that you know because we haven't had female performers in classical music nearly as long as we've had male performers in classical music women don't have the sort of uniform that men have. Um, but I think even that uniform is, is starting to finally go away for, for men. So it's, it, it's, and it is something that we would almost exclusively read about in articles about women performing, uh, as, as opposed to men performing. There are God, a handful are so of guys. Repressed. There. Okay. I mean, there there are a handful of performers that we do read read about the way they they dress or the way they look when they perform. We talked about Han Bin on the show a few months ago, uh, the violinist who wears like you know almost I would say a costume mm-hmm. to perform. Yeah, that's different to me. I mean, I think so too. Yeah, she's stretching the bounds of quote normal fashion, and Han Bin is going into the costume arena clearly. It doesn't even seem like that much of a stretch, though. What 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 she wears, because I mean, it's it's stuff you see people wear all the time. And right, and and they're talking about working with um, designers, yeah. right? She's working with with people that are making a different kind of art. Well, the idea is that her look will take away from the audience's experience and focusing on the music instead of focusing on her legs. You know. I mean, having physical performers there takes away from the music as well. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think that's part of why we go to live performances, right? Is to see the people playing the music, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm making it up. 
Go go ahead, Missy. The whole idea that women, um, I, the whole idea that women are distracting in any way, or that you know a female conductor who has like long hair and wears a dress would be distracting, is sort of like a, a very sort of old, very sexist um, way of looking at things. Right. And you know, I've heard that you know forever and ever, and it, that's something that's very dangerous for that to get into the heads of you know young female performers or even composers. You know, who have to be in, in the public eye even for a much shorter amount of time, like when you bow. And um, it's something that I thought about a lot and have got a lot of comments for. Um, you know, for clothes, especially when I was like much wilder in college and stuff, and I would wear crazy stuff, and I would that would always be the one thing people would focus on. But you're right in that you know. This is nothing, it's nothing um, that you don't see people wearing all the time on the streets in Brooklyn. You know, this is not shocking. It's only shocking in the context of men wearing suits and performing for hundreds and hundreds of years. Right, right. And that's so, something that say, Midget comments on in the article is that, you know, she, she or maybe, maybe, I think it was Midget, links to a, a, another set of photos of other people in L.A., uh, at an event a few days later wearing stuff that's almost the same in the same style as what Yuja Wang was wearing for this performance like this isn't weird mm -hmm. stuff it's just weird in this context it's in weird in just right. an unusual way not not what we're used to seeing well so, uh, the one the one complaint that I think some people might have whether you think it's justified or not uh, is and there's a quote from the article uh, uh, talking about how we're wringing our hands over the possible demise of classical music. And yet when a young classical music star does something that would be completely normal in any other entertainment field, we pounce on it being as being extreme. Calling it an entertainment field, you know, people don't, you either do or don't think it's entertainment, you know. Some people might be offended at the idea of calling Rachmaninoff's Third Piano Concerto entertainment, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't think that dress would be unusual in any other art field either. No. So no. She puts this um, no. poll on her. Oh, go ahead. No, no, no! Please okay. go ahead. God, I was just saying no. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, she puts this poll. She made a poll um, in the article and said, "Should classical music critics comment on a female musician's attire?" Um, so the options are yes. If it's distracting and inappropriate and inappropriate, yes, because pointing out that classical musicians are trendy and dress well can attract younger audiences. No, the only thing that matters in a music review is the music. And no, because critics don't typically comment about what men in classical music wear. Yeah. Um, well, I think they do if it's noteworthy. And I think that's that's the thing that I take away, is that if 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 the if it's noteworthy, you mention it. I mean, that's right. what we expect of people and, and that don't are doing they journalism, actually mention some right? Like we, expect, we expect them to, um, you know, comment on the the whole concert. Mm -hmm. And sometimes part of that is what the people are wearing. It's interesting to me, too. Like, of so far of the 1,700 people that have voted, most people voted no. And, mm -hmm. uh, and the... The, the winner so far is that the music is what matters and so you shouldn't worry about anything else in the that's, music review. That's, that's nice in the ideal world. <laughs> yeah. I'm, and then second, well, I, is, I don't think that's true, though. In. Go ahead, Missy. I have a problem. I mean, should classical music critics comment on a female musician's attire? I mean, that sort of question is sort of doomed. You know, it should right. be a, a musician's <laughs> attire. Right. You should be asking this question for men and women. Yeah. So... And, and, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't know how to answer this question, right. actually. And, but I, I would agree with you. I, I, I think that the, we need to be taking into consideration the entire experience of seeing a concert. So, you know, how you feel when you walk in. Is there video playing? Is there good lighting? What, and that part of that is what people are wearing. So, yeah, if it works within the general show, say something about it. Or if it doesn't work, say something about it. But don't let it be, she's showing too much leg. It's inappropriate. I mean, those sorts of criteria don't really, that, that feels sexist to me and doesn't really make much sense. Right. Though I do think I, I like it when reviewers go out on a limb and make value judgments like that. I'm, I'm really tired of reading reviews that are like reading 
the account of a baseball game where it's just everything mm-hmm. that happened in the order that it happened. And I, I, I'm, I'm totally okay with reviewers making value judgments. And, I, and if they make a value judgment like that, it's fine that I can, I can disagree with them then. But um, I, I think, again, any, any performer that's wearing something noteworthy, sure, mention it. And, and it's okay to not mention it if they're not wearing anything noteworthy. And, you know, you have to hand it to her. I think she's a genius because she's getting all kinds of, uh, you know, uh, search engine optimization out of wearing these dresses. So more power to her. Sure. It, Dave, let's, <laughs> let's play, we'll play a little YouTube video that was embedded in, uh, in, in the, uh, the Washington Post article. Let's play a, a little clip of, of her playing Scriabin. whole program you can watch all of on on youtube and it's it's a whole program of, of scriabin uh short selections and this is far from the the most virtuosic of the selections but one thing i think that is important to point out is that she's also a really good pianist and mm-hmm. i think i would be offended if she was getting gigs and getting all this Absolute. attention if she was a crappy pianist that was just getting all this attention because she's gorgeous, which she is. Um, right, she's that good. would be offensive, but if now she's it's bonus. she's actually it's bonus. yeah, this, I mean, even, this is there's no there's nothing wrong with her doing that and and being a fantastic pianist. I, so I don't. Well, I, there are certainly people who are famous performers that don't play that well and are just pretty in the in the 80s there was a saxophonist named candy dolfer who was oh, nothing to write home about at all and she was a babe and she got a record deal and had a vh1 video and all that so oh, yeah so speaking of value judgments hit me work, sam i'm done talking about that i think it's a non-issue uh, Steve Reich and None Such Records decided uh, last week or earlier this week to pull the controversial cover to WTC 911 featuring the Kronos Quartet. It's wild. Crazy. <laughs> Sam, I, I know that you have some strong opinions about this. I think that they wussed out big time. No matter <laughs> whether you thought it was good or bad at the beginning they did it you know they announced it they put it out there they should have stuck to their guns why missy has some feelings about this too (laughs) missy why don't you first share with us what you thought of the the original cover what did you think when that was released i my first thought was and really my last thought this is bad art (laughs) i like the piece I saw the um, I saw Kronos do it at Carnegie Hall recently as part of, in well I guess in late April as part of the um, birthday celebration and I I like the piece I love the ending I think it's beautiful and that cover does not it's not appropriate for the piece at all and I right. think I, it's part of the sort of trend I see and of things being so obvious you know like. This is a piece about 9-11. Here's a photo of 9-11. It's just, you know, where's the art there? <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. Uh, so. Right. Well, for those of you that have forgotten, let me just put up, uh, this, is, this is the Slate article, one of the Slate articles talking about it with a photo. If you're in the video version of the podcast, you can see the original cover. It's If you're in the audio and you, you missed it, um, it's a photo that was taken right before the second plane hit the second World Trade Center tower uh, on September 11, 2011. 2011? Uh, to, uh, 2001, goodness. Uh, thank you, Sam. And uh, so it, it's, it's this iconic photo, and it's been doctored to look 
really grimy and it just has Steve Reich across the top and WTC 911 Kronos Quartet across the bottom. Um, so sorry, go ahead, Patrick. I wanted to say that this is this is good for the album. Um, whether you agree with the cover or not, the fact that there was a controversial cover, now it's being taken away, is going to create so much buzz um, come September 20th when this album is released that it's going to sell a lot more than I think it would have even if they had just the original cover on it. That may be true. I, I don't know how many people there are, how, how big the audience is for a disc like this to begin with. So I'm not sure how how much more or less they're going to get because of well, this I mean, controversial it, issue. Simply put, this is press. Yeah. This is press for the album. Yeah. I, I will say that I, dis I disagree with Sam, that I, I don't think it's, it's wussing out to pull the cover. I think that I respect people who uh, can take criticism and maybe change their mind about something. Mm -hmm. I think maybe all of the heat that they took from the original cover caused them to to change their mind and i think it's good that when they have a change of heart that they um share that but they didn't and, have to make change their heart how do you know why do you have to be so cynical <laughs> because they were browbeat into changing it i mean it, what it says to me is they made a horrible decision to begin with like they didn't think of either either they knew that this was going to happen and they planned on changing it from the beginning just to get press or wow that's the most cynical thing i've ever heard you say <laughs> and i must say that's saying something yeah or they just made a really stupid decision in putting that art on there to begin with i think what they say in the article is that they they changed it because they realized that it was like a poor artistic decision using that image and that they they could do something better Right, and that's, I think well, that's, they, go ahead, Missy. Oh, they felt that it was distracting, that that I think the press, it had become such an issue, maybe right. because it's summer and nobody has anything else to talk about, yeah. <laughs> but that it would be distracting from the music. Yeah, so. and, and, and it may be that they did agree with the many people who said that it's just a poor reflection of the piece. Um, cer certainly, there were, that was, there was that a was lot. That was Seth Coulter Walls, uh criticism yes that, that what you're, you're right patrick points out that seth coulter walls who wrote uh the first article about this for slate uh not the first article about it the first one in slate um uh, commented that he he wasn't offended by the use of the image in a commercial context which was the source of a lot of the indignation about the cover um his particular problem with it was that it was a really crappy representation of the piece of music that it's supposed to represent mm -hmm. um i so. agree it does not make me want to listen to the piece sorry i didn't mean to interrupt go but ahead. yeah go ahead yeah no it's that's that's what i was yeah. saying it just doesn't the piece is you know i think is nuanced and well there's some things that are not nuanced it's steve reich mm -hmm. but he's gonna like <laughs> yeah. hit you in the face with a lot of stuff but again in the end you have like maya beiser singing these beautiful um this beautiful text and and it just sort of it's very it was, seeing it in New York is particularly was a very emotional, profound experience. And then to yeah. have, like, I, I've seen this image a million times. Like I don't need to, I don't need to have that slapped in my face on this beautiful nuanced interpretation of the event. Right. Yeah, that's one thing that image is not is nuanced. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like my, my feeling about it when I saw it was like, you know, I wasn't offended or anything. But I thought it was a pretty boneheaded decision to make that the album cover, just because, like Missy said, we've all seen that a hundred times. And the treatment they give it doesn't do anything to really change it. I mean, it makes it look like it's a lithograph that's been run over in the street by a dump truck or something. That's about the only thing that they did to it. Um, like, I can think of all kinds of ways to, to take that image and process it some way so it takes the edge off of it so it even references it lightly but doesn't just like just take this image that we've all seen and just throw it up there right so now let's talk about something much li much lighter <laughs> <laughs> much lighter than than indignation about september 11th album covers yeah um is uh, something that that we have talked about before is the use of social media in uh presenting classical music to a, a wider audience or a younger audience at least 
And um, one thing that has come from that is people feeling more comfortable using their mobile phones wherever they are to tweet, even in uh, theaters and auditoriums where performances are going on. Um, so there was a, a blog post about this recently uh, on uh, Non Devisi, which is one of the Inside the Arts blogs. Um, what do you guys think about tweeting during concerts? Well, first, let's see who here has tweeted during a concert before. Any tweeted, kind of concert. I've tweeted during intermission, and I usually do tweet in, during intermission. <laughs> I've uh, I don't think I've ever tweeted during a classical music concert. I might have <laughs> like played Scrabble on my phone during a Mozart symphony or something. <laughs> I don't think I've tweeted actually while anybody was playing, but I have been tempted to tweet while someone was playing many times. Yes. And I and I thought to myself, I shouldn't do that because everybody behind me is going to see my bright phone yeah. glowing around. That's the, that's I mean, that's the only thing that stopped me. So, let me let me ask you, what if you're in the back of the concert hall or in a box seat or something like that where nobody can see you and you're enjoying it? I don't them? see any I problem. absolutely would do it. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, a, a point they make in the article, it's like, what's, uh, it's so distracting to see somebody use their phone. Other than the fact that it, d different phones do this to different degrees, it causes like the light to come on and all that stuff. But as far as just like looking at something, it's no more distracting than somebody reading their program during the performance. And that happens constantly. I've seen people reading magazines, like magazine. they bring a magazine to the concert and read yeah. a magazine. I don't. I mean, if that's how they want to experience the concert, whatever. You know, that's their decision. I think it's a stupid one, but <laughs> they're free to make people it. People do all sorts. Of, yeah, I people do all sorts of crazy things during concerts, but I don't. I feel like looking at a screen is definitely much more distracting than someone sitting next to you reading a program. And there's something about the that bright screen coming on that is, for me, like a totally different realm mm -hmm. right and um i mean i feel like people tweeting during concerts is like the downfall of civilization <laughs> <laughs> it's not bad. to be overly <laughs> dramatic <laughs> that that's who i am i'm overly dramatic <laughs> no it's cool because i went to um they're not uh so i went oh, to they're, they're, uh, I know we have a little bit of problem. lag here. <laughs> yeah. um, Go ahead. I saw I went to the last performance or the most recent performance, uh, well, Friday's performance of the Mostly Mozart Festival, mm -hmm. and um, Christine Brewer and Jeremy Dank both gave performances, along with the Mozart Mostly Mozart Festival Orchestra. It was an all Beethoven program, mm -hmm. um, and Jeremy Dank played Beethoven's Second Piano Concerto. And it was amazing. I, I, I was an experience like none other. I've never seen like the delicacy and playing in a lot uh, in a live concert than I saw when Jeremy played. Um, and that was really, really, really a great experience for me. And I wanted to let everybody know it. So as soon as intermission hit, I turned on my phone and I tweeted about it. And I don't feel bad about that at all. Oh, no. Tweeting during intermission is a totally different thing. I think that's totally the best use of Twitter ever is to share that experience. But mm -hmm. if you had tweeted it during the concert, it would have meant that you had stopped listening. So what's the point? You know, yeah, people cannot tweet and listen at the same time. I really believe that. And you don't at least you're not listening with the same sort of intensity and focus that you were probably giving to Jeremy Dank. Right. So right. I just don't think and, and these sort of like kind of desperate sort of PR kind of things where people or where ensembles or orchestras will encourage listeners to or people in the audience to tweet like a live sort of thing during the show is to me so desperate and ridiculous because you're asking people not to listen to you anymore. <laughs> well, I, I don't but know. tweeting during an well, audition is totally appropriate. I, I don't know about tweeting uh, being... But like encouraged by anyone I think that w is a little weird yeah. but I think it's totally okay to allow people that want to do that to do it and I I mean like like we were saying earlier I wouldn't make this decision I, I would probably not decide to tweet because like you said Missy that 
doing that would then um, distract me from listening, which is the reason I would want to tweet. Now, yeah. I might tweet if something's really terrible. I might tweet <laughs> that it's terrible and not feel bad about being distracted. Um, and I would also be pretty open That's to just tweeting that nice. something is terrible. Oh, are you kidding me? <laughs> Go home. <laughs> But I mean, I, I I'm totally okay with other people doing it because that's their decision. You know, they they bought a concert ticket the same as I did. Mm -hmm. It's not just I, I can ignore their phone screen lighting up, and if they want to listen casually for the 15 seconds it takes them to send a tweet, whatever. Mm -hmm. no, the, the purchase of the ticket is like a little contract you sign. We say, I'm not going to piss anyone else off while we're going to this concert. Well, and, and I'm saying that that doesn't piss me off, and if it pisses other people off, then they're too easily pissed off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it pisses me off. <laughs> it would be you interesting don't... to me to have this same conversation 15 years from now. Yeah, that'd be you know? curious. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Things it's change. just going to become more mm -hmm. But yeah. I feel like it's someone, it's like, you wouldn't tolerate someone standing there with a little flashlight during a show and like turning it on for 20 seconds and turning it off, That's you know, true. and it's the phone screen is the same thing. To yeah. Me. But you know, I think, uh, society is get it is going to become more and more so that people like, there's all kinds of things that you've just learned to overlook. Um, you know, and like I, a phone is not really a phone anymore. It's a hand computer. And in a sense, it's like a brain helper. So everybody carries their pocket brain helper with them. And it's going to become more and more common for people to whip out their brain helper at any moment and use it, you know. And if they want to do that during a concert, it's just going to start happening more and more, I think. I mean, sure. I, I know people that, that follow the score during a performance. I have brought a score to a performance. I know people that take notes during a performance. And those things don't bother me. And those are Reviewers. both things that you might want to do on a smartphone instead of with the <laughs> pencil and paper. And I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with them doing those things with their smartphone instead of a pencil and paper, right? I I was a few weeks ago at the New York Phil for the summer concerts and Harry Rolnick, who writes for Concerto Net, was right sitting right behind me. Right behind him was Tony Tomasini and both of them are like, hmm. And I can hear like the graphite uh, <laughs> on the paper as they're writing and these little hmm hmm hmms the going on. So, like, yeah. it, it, it was a little distracting, I gotta, I gotta admit. <laughs> what was what was distracting was the was it the sound yeah it was the sound you could you could okay. you could definitely hear someone writing so do you think it would be less distracting then if you could only see them and you couldn't hear them because i think tweeting is relatively silent as an activity i guess so i mean it, yeah i couldn't i couldn't see them so i and mean I, I think this is another thing that that has changed like Sam said, in, in 10 years, we may have a completely different conversation about this. And I think just five years ago, the conversation would have been very different as well. Um, when I was a, an undergraduate student, I did a study abroad in Italy. And one of our assignments was read an article from an Italian newspaper and talk to the teacher about it in Italian. And um, the, uh, a friend of mine got this article about the reopening of La Scala. La Scala had just reopened uh, that season, and the uh, Prime Minister of Italy, or Berlusconi, was at this, or President, Prime Minister, President. Anyway. Prime Minister. The, okay, I'll go with Prime, I think it was Prime Minister. Sure. Anyway, um, we, he was at the performance, and apparently during the whole second half of the opera, his whole face was lit up by his phone, because he was playing games on his phone, because he was bored with the opera. <laughs> and that was like the gist of the article and everybody in the opera house could see it because it's the, the, you know European style opera house where there's the stalls <coughs> that go around the whole uh, theater so everybody can see everybody else yeah. um, so it was kind of a mild scandal though in the Berlusconi terms it's nothing um, yeah he's hardly a model of class here right you know? right <laughs> So may maybe we should all hold ourselves to slightly higher standards than Berlusconi. I well, think in every part of our life we should. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's prob probably Silvio Berlusconi, bad example. Mm -hmm. 
I like the idea of calling, tweeting during a concert, pulling a barrel of scum. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it has been done. We're going to make that. All right. Anybody watching Sound Notion, this is a new thing. Using your phone during the concert is a Berlusconi. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if we can make that a thing. <laughs> All right. Is it time to move on? I think so. I believe so. How are we doing on time, by the way? We're, we're doing great. Ish. Cool. <laughs> uh, so, from concerts where you go somewhere to hear music to Spotify where you can hear your music anywhere. Oh, man. You see what I did there? I see that. That was a very smooth transition, <laughs> Sam. That's right. Um, so Spotify, a new service in the United States, uh, been around for a while in the UK. Uh, it's Swedish. Oh. There's, really? there's a Wikipedia entry for Spotify. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, assuming it's not all propaganda or something. Mm -hmm. It's a Swedish-based uh, service that's been around since 2008. So it's Spotify, I guess, is a Swedish project. Thank you, Sam. And uh, it's been in, in Europe for a couple of years now. And uh, it's recently open service in the United States thanks to some new deals with record companies. Um, and it's, it's a pretty cool service for discovering new music because you can for free listen to anything that you want. Um, and for a small fee, monthly fee, listen to those things on your mobile device and even download them to your mobile device to hang on to later. So it's, it's got a lot of really great features, but one of the um, less great features is how people who are, uh, are artists represented on those record labels that are making deals with Spotify are getting paid. Not so hot. So this is actually an infographic that I'm going to put in the video of how much... Uh, you have to sell for uh, selling CDs compared to how many iTunes CDs you would have to sell and then all the way down to Rhapsody streams and at the very bottom, Spotify streams to make U.S. minimum wage. So to make U.S. minimum wage, if you're pressing your own CDs and selling them, you have to, for, for 10 bucks, you have to sell 143 of them a month to make U.S. minimum wage. Now, if we scroll down a little bit to iTunes album downloads, you'd have to sell about 1,229 of them. Now, all the way down to Rhapsody Streams, where we start to uh, not actually purchase the music, but just listen to it for free, is 849,817 plays per month to make U.S. minimum wage. And if we go all the way down to Spotify now, I will say that this Spotify deal, uh, this is an infographic from about a year ago when Spotify was only available in uh, Europe. And this is uh, gr British pounds converted at the time to US dollars. But to make US minimum wage uh, in Spotify streams a year ago, you're track would have had to been played 4,053,110 <laughs> times. That's ridiculous. So it's great for people listening to music. It may not be great for people uh, who are making music. So Do you how is think this... that's something we should consider? Well, that's what I want to know. How is this generated? Are the artists going to where the audience already is, or is the audience going to where the artists, the labels already are? I don't think I understand what your question like, why would somebody choose Spotify over iTunes? Or why would, a, why would an artist want to be on one more prominently than the other? Is it because there's more people? I don't think that's the people? kind of thing that artists choose. Do you think? Well, if you're an indie artist, uh, indie artist certainly. I don't, I don't really know signed. how indie artists can get on Spotify. I think Because Spotify has to have deals with all these record labels. Um, hmm. I don't know. I don't know how that works. Missy, Missy as, as part of your band, what would you do? Well, and I actually, I don't really understand the benefit of being on Spotify at this point, given, you know, I've gone over all those numbers that you just mentioned and um, heard horror stories of uh, musicians, not just who are released independently, but on smaller labels, trying to get off Spotify and being unable to get off Spotify. So until that stuff goes away, I'm not even, wouldn't even consider it. Interesting. Um, so... 
you know, yeah, that's it. I mean, I, I, I think there's a benefit. One of the, one of the benefits to Spotify for, um, listeners is not just the ability to listen to the tracks, but the ability to discover tracks without having to buy them. And that's, I think one of the biggest problems in digital music is that you only get to listen to maybe a 30 second clip and it may not be a representative 30 second clip because they're usually chosen more or less randomly by a computer. Um, it's really hard to figure out what kind of music you want to buy without the ability to listen to it all first. And I think that's one of the benefits of Spotify that you can't get from iTunes or buying the CD or, or whatever else. That seems strange mm -hmm. to see the benefit of Spotify as a previewing device for actually using a different service to get your music. Mm -hmm. and well, because I can use Spotify to listen to anything in their free service. Yeah. And I don't have to pay for it. Hmm. I mean, that's so something like RDO, which is a, a streaming service that's been in the U.S. for a while, has doesn't have a free service. It has paid two paid monthly services. But they also have uh, a purchase, a, a so purchase can, the digital download, the there too. so you can actually buy it from them as well. Okay. So maybe that's the compromise. Um, I don't know. What do you guys, Sam? What do you, what's your opinion? You're the one that I think pulled this article. No, I didn't. Can you oh. hear me? Yeah, I got you. Okay, I tried something in my internal mix to see if it'll make the problem stop happening. Um, uh, well, this article. To me, it seems like – I mean I get where the guy's coming from, and I agree with Missy. that Because of the way Spotify works, it's not going to work for anybody other than a huge pop star because they're the only people who are going to achieve the volume. Um, you know, four million I think four million is a pretty huge volume, and they're not making anything on it. So I don't even know if that's helpful. Yeah. Well – but but this this guy Brian Brandt is more or less suggesting folding back into older models, and you know uh, people aren't going to stand for that. People want to be able to have music and search music and have their own music or any music they want to hear whenever they want it, and the market's going to deliver that no matter what he or anybody else thinks. Um, so Spotify not about to be the answer, but something like Spotify or something that uses the cloud is going to be the answer, and. Him suggesting that you actually go out and buy a CD, that's that's complete wishful thinking, and it's not going to happen, and it's not going to save indie labels. I'm done with physical media. I had a friend who's, who's banned recently. I went to one of their shows, and they were selling CDs, and I'm like, I, I want to buy your stuff, but I don't, I don't want a physical disc. I'm moving. Right. I don't want to move another physical thing. I want digital things. That's right. Can I give you 10 bucks and email me? Well, that's yeah, what I'm I saying. I don't even want a digital I'm like, thing. I'll pay for this thing. I just want the digital copy. I don't. I want the content. I don't want the thing. I just want access to it whenever I want it. Well, Did that's another. Them? That's another animal. That's you know another cloud service thing. Did they put work into the album cover? <laughs> what? <laughs> what do you mean? Well, I mean, what was? Was there some? artistic value in in the production of the cd or was it just hey this is a cd and it's black or it's white and no i mean the know. album cover was nice it wasn't anything to write home about i thought there was a very lovely looking album but how many times are do you are you telling me that you get home and you pull out your cd wallet thing no, and like flip no. through your cover art and oh that's beautiful <laughs> no, of course. it's uh, oh, we talked about this beautiful. weeks ago <laughs> that's beautiful I love this album art stuff. We, I need some more we, of it. We I need to buy some CDs so I can look at the album art. Is that what yeah. you do? No, I don't do that. But I mean, for like the super fan of the band, we talked about this before. You know, it's that's the sentiment of buying the disc. Now, I don't, I don't care about discs really either. So, I mean, I'm just, I'm just kind of throwing out a rope for the people who might enjoy that. Yeah. Okay. Well, in oh. every new Radiohead album that comes out, I'm going to go and pick up the CD, probably. You'll pick up the vinyl, Sam. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll do Just something. I'll buy some package. artifact because I'm that big of a fan. Yeah. But, you know. <laughs> but I, don't, I, think, I think it's unreasonable to expect everybody else to be that big of a fan of every piece of music they listen to. Well, which is why it's great that there's all these, like, there's all these different models of buying in, like, getting different degrees of the art and having like a yeah different levels of ownership yeah i mean and also like you get the mp3 download you get the lossless you get the package you get the whole 
director's sure. cut or whatever. And, and, and a lot of people, a lot of artists that are selling digital media these days, both in, in books and in music, which are the two, I think, biggest digital media sales right now, um, are, are doing kind of like individual art craft yeah. type right now. forms. Sam, I was getting a little bit of your thing again. I think um, that was a clip. Anyway, uh, so yeah, it won't audio cut completely out. All right. Well, we'll have to cut that again too. But <laughs> um, so you you know you can get like an individually numbered special handcrafted thing, you know, and they'll make like two hundred or five hundred for the, like the really crazy hardcore fans, and it'll be like eighty dollars or three hundred dollars for something that is a neat little art piece. Mm -hmm. But I think it's unreasonable to expect everybody that wants this Cory Doctorow book to pay $300 for the special artistically presented version of it as opposed to 10 or 20 bucks for the ebook. Yeah, and I think this is all such a developing world of experiencing this art in different ways and giving attribution and appreciation to the artists in all these different ways. And I, I hope that we get to have the artists get what they deserve, but also maintain this this whole network of being able to experience all the stuff that's out there wherever you want. Mm -hmm. And and yeah, hopefully that'll keep developing, which I'm sure it will. Yeah. Well, should we should we continue on to the pick of the week, I think? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. So our pick of the week this week is from uh, our guest joining us today, Missy Mazzoli. Thank you again. Um, sure. It's uh, the the track is for a thousand tongues. Uh, is this available yes. commercially right now, Missy, or is this only on your website? No, this is available. Um, actually, it's on Jody Redditch's album on New Amsterdam Records, okay. which okay. I believe is out it's called of minutia and memory and um i think i feel like it's out this next week this week um cool but i'm looking at it right now Excellent. <laughs> but you know um if, if it's not out right now it will be out really soon all right Great. so do you want to you want to tell us about this piece maybe preface the the clip we're about to hear Sure. Um, well, this is a piece that was commissioned by uh, cellist Jody Redditch. And Jody is remarkable in that she um, also sings while she plays and also has a lot of experience working with electronics and doing these sort of um, solo shows. Mm -hmm. And she um, has commissioned a lot of composers, particularly New York composers. And, um, <coughs> and so... Yeah, so asked me to to write this piece, and I found this text by Stephen Crane, um, which is actually untitled, but the first line is, I have a thousand tongues, and nine and ninety-nine lie, which I thought was kind of cool, a cool text yeah. to set. Um, but yeah, so it's, so it's amplified cello, and then there's a sort of electronic track that um, is actually piano samples, but they're manipulated and reversed and slowed down and processed. Um, so that you, the idea is you can't really tell um, what they are. Cool. Cool. Well, uh, let's let's listen to it. Hold on, Judd. When is Jody's album out? It's out uh, end of the month. End of the month. Okay. Cool. So the awesome. um, my friend Judd Greenstein just walked into the room, and he uh, is one of the co-founders of New Amsterdam Records, which is very convenient timing. <laughs> <Yeah>. that, um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Go for it. Thanks. Here's a clip. Here's a little clip. Thank you. 
if we jump ahead a little bit, we get to hear some of the singing. Yeah, go for it. Jump ahead a little. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, that's really amazing singing to be done while playing the cello. That's very yeah, impressive. Yeah, it's really hard. Yeah, <laughs> and it's sort of the the very extreme top of her range, and it's um, she's really one of the only people who can who can do it. And other cellists who have done it, you know, they usually take it down an octave or do it in a different way. Mm-hmm. Is, is it ever done so, with, with is, separate players? For, for no. The the voice? Okay. No, no, because I think that even if a cellist is not a good singer, I'd rather have them sing it, because okay. it's sort of about this sort of raw vocal quality and everything coming from the same place. Cool. Okay, that's really cool. That's really cool. And there's also a version of this for viola, right? Yes, and I wrote that. I arranged that for um, Nadia Sirota, who also does the singing herself. Excellent. Has, so, it, has it ever been performed, I'm curious, by a male performer? No. <laughs> I would love I would love for a male cellist to like take it on because I'd probably I would rearrange it for him. How about so, a male violist? If anyone's listening <laughs> wants to do it. Well Nate's a violist. <laughs> I think Nate Nate's got the Nate false head chops for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've heard Nate sing pretty high. <laughs> I'll shoot you an email later about it. We can Talk about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so Definitely. this comes across to me as sort of a recording studio project. Yes, definitely does, headphones listening. Yeah, it's got some. Yeah, it's got some cool. You got to listen to it on headphones, man. But uh, uh, it does get performed live, and so I'm wondering, mm-hmm. like, what do you do when you perform it live? Like, <laughs> how do you do that? Like, do you? Well, I mean, do you process it, a piano signal really... live or? No, no, no. All the processing is done ahead of time. And so it's just this sort of electronic track that's in the room and the cell and the cellist or violist just can play along. And it's subtly rhythmic enough that they can just sync up with it. So it's like playing with a track, but they there is the cello is amplified and they have a microphone that they sing into. Yeah, and there's also Jody the cell the Jody Reddish would do it with distortion sometimes. So the overall effect is that um, it's not like karaoke where you have someone playing along right. with a uh, with a tape or something. It's um, all sort of seems to be coming from you don't quite know where things are coming from. Yeah, right. So which I really like. I really like that. I'd love to see a performance of this because I have this image in my head of the the cellist sitting in the middle of a big empty stage and having this this stuff coming from around them as they're singing and playing this stuff. And that, that sounds really interesting. Mm-hmm. I loved it. Well, I I met I met you, Missy, at the River to River festival where this piece was mm-hmm. performed and it was at st paul's chapel and i thought that was a great venue for this piece because there was real real great reverb coming you know from a from an old chapel and i thought it just kind of really mm-hmm. encompassed the space really nicely yeah thanks we also that night we did it with a film um my friend jennifer stock you know created new films for a bunch of my music um and we had projected that live. So it helped to create, I mean, I think with all of my music, I'm trying to create a world for the audience to step into. And it's not just about sitting there and listening. It's about feeling that you're immersed in this world, even if it's just for, what, six, seven minutes. Um, so the films help and the electronics help and the way everything is spaced out is very important. Mm-hmm. So you're talking about this immersion in a world when you're, writing the piece are you thinking about a visual element to that world um sometimes um usually no you know usually it's more of an an emotional feeling i think that that's i just that's sort of why i write music is to um whoa is to um it's to with the idea of trying to create that with every piece um but I do, it's funny though, but I do think very visually in the, in the very early stages of composition, often I'll, you know, draw a shape or have a sort of, um, 
color scheme in mind, which sounds sort of cheesy, not when I say it out loud, but it's true. You know, just this sort of very vague visual impressions of something that I want to create. Um, but I don't impose that on the filmmaker or um, it's more just, I don't know, an emotional space. Yeah, I was curious about how that collaboration worked. So do you do you go back and forth with the film or do you just kind of give the music over to the filmmaker and let the filmmaker do whatever with it? Um, well, at this point, with working with Jennifer Stock, um, we have sort of a common language that we both use that fits very well together. So at this point, I just give her the music. She creates the film. She usually shows it to me, and I say, that's fantastic, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, she created films for um, my band's live show, cool. my band Victoire. Um, so working with her on you know eight of those tracks, we sort of came up with this abstract painterly language that works for the music and she triggers it live you know so that when for example when this when the, when the performer starts singing in this piece the film changes dramatically and things start moving in a completely different way so it's not just a film that runs and is synced she's it's like a visualization kind of yeah she she sits there you know in the back of the hall and triggers different different sections of it and and messes with cool. it and sort of practices video live um in mm. response to the music yeah live video is sweet we're we're mm -hmm. fans of live electronic things mm -hmm. here at sound notion yeah <laughs> <laughs> um to me i i think the piece is just beautiful and the most you, captivating yeah. thing to me is that the piano sounds so processed you know, so and it's a, it's rich and you know it's filling up the space the, the the in the headphones if you're listening on headphones, and the cello is amplified but not so that it's big and strong. It's so that it's got that like you can really hear the bow on the string kind of quality to it. You know, and uh, those two together to me are, are just what makes it really beautiful or one of the contributing factors. I really grab a kind of like operatic feel from this piece, especially when the sure. singer comes in. It sounds like it sounds like like this kind of new aria or something like that, because the piece is fairly short. You know, it's not a it's not a huge huge piece, and and the singer is is prominent, and just the the purity of the voice that comes out really has kind of operatic quality that I I think is really great for this piece. And we're we're big fans of ten minute pieces here at Sound Notion too. <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty much all I write these days. Yeah. Well, is yeah, I mean, this, a topic we've harped on many times on the show is that if you're going to write a 22-minute piece, you know, or something like that, people just aren't geared towards listening to pieces that long anymore, you know, whether you think it's good or bad or otherwise. I'm not sure they ever were. Right. Well, I mean, right. when Verdi's Requiem was premiering, you know, that was a different story. You're going to see that, and you're likely never going to see it again, mm -hmm. and and, you know, I've got a file for this piece on my computer, and I can listen to it whenever I want. So a little under seven minutes is great length for me. Yeah. Yeah. Even those pieces are, were in movements and sections, you know, and even every opera is sort of in broken into sections. I mean, with the exception of, like, I don't know, some movements of symphonies that are indeed 22 minutes long or Mahler, I don't know, you could say this there are these longer chunks of music. Everything is sort of broken up into these very listenable pieces. Right. So, yeah. 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 I think that's a normal human sort of, there's a limit to it. It's like the amount of numbers you can memorize is like 10, cause, and that's what a phone number is or something. I don't know. Yeah. Do, you, yeah. do you have, um, in, in, have you thought about um, how your band playing experience has, has, uh, influence the way you write music because that's another thing that I think of when I think of music by bands is usually <laughs> on the shorter side as well mm -hmm. yeah I mean and I guess all the well the pieces on our album um, Cathedral City are all really in like the five to seven minute mm -hmm. range so it's on the shorter side I guess of my output mm -hmm. um, but, but I, I I feel like that was sort of, but the, the thing about it is that I conceived of that album as a sort of symphony. I, I conceived of all the, of these eight pieces yeah. that would go together from beginning to end. Um, and 
it sort of is one big piece that addresses similar things that come back um, and, and themes that come back again and again. And, and the, pr the placement of the electronics is very uh, particular. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that, I, I don't know. In terms of length, I don't. So I don't think in terms of length that. Well, not, not just length, but I mean, how how in general has has your experience with the band influenced the music that you're writing? Yeah, well, the band is great because it's you know four of my best friends, um, and we get together in a room and we can play through stuff that fails spectacularly, <laughs> <laughs> but it's not happening in front of anybody. It's happening like in my living room and they'll tell me if something's not working and we'll work some th things out together. So in that sense, it's been very liberating and I've, I've been able to expand my sort of sonic palette um, because of the band in very significant ways. And it's also just sort of um, comforting and reassuring that, you know, to have this sort of space where I can do whatever I want and it's um, allowed me to be a lot more experimental and free and intuitive in all of my work. Because I know that even if I never get another commission, I will still have this band and I can still get them together and make music. Yeah. Um, and it's not yeah. dependent on the economy or other people or style or what's in vogue. Like I will just always be able to bring people together and make music in a room. <laughs> room. I think that every person should have that. Speaking well, of commissions, what's coming down the road for you? Um, well, the next year, um, or I should say this coming season, starting next month, uh, I'm going to be composer in residence with Albany Symphony. Um, so I'll be doing a new, arranging an old piece for them in November and then doing writing a new piece for them for May. Um, and the Detroit Commission, Detroit Symphony we talked about. And then I'm doing a, writing a piece for um, my advisor, cellist my advisor, and the singer Helga Davis, um, which is a piece for cello, actually another piece for cello, voice, and electronics. <laughs> Um, but a longer, like a 20 minute sort of song cycle for them. Interesting. Cool. Well, I think we should probably wrap up then. What do you guys think? The picture of your band on the band's website is badass. <laughs> hey! <laughs> yeah, Thank it's so you. cool to me. Just composers doing, like, having a group and, and doing that. And it's really exciting to hear about. Um, your band operating like a regular band. I mean, opening for some other band, do it, touring around the country and doing yeah. doing the stuff, and like mm -hmm. that's just exciting to hear about. Yeah. So so thank hey. you so much for joining us. This has been a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for having me. This is, this is great. Um, so I guess that that's that's going to be it for this week's Sound Notion. Um, if you have any comments or questions about any of the things that we've talked about on the show. You can leave those comments for us on the post for this episode at soundnotion.tv slash sn and leave us a note there. You can also connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. If you like the show, we'd love for you to share it with friends or donate using the links on our site. I also want to take a quick moment to plug a new show that we just launched last week called Streamers and Punches. Uh, it's about film music, so if film music is something that interests anybody watching this show, you should check it out. That's at soundnotion.tv slash SAP. Um, and I think you'll, you'll really enjoy it. We just recorded a great interview this last week with the very famous film composer Bruce Broughton. Um, it, was, it was really interesting talking to him. So you should definitely check that out. None of us, by the way, are on that podcast. So if you don't like us personally, first of all, I don't know why you watched this whole hour. <laughs> but if you did and you're thinking, man, I can't stand those guys, but I really like film music check out this one. Again, soundnotion.tv slash SAP. Um, Sound Notion's introduction includes music by our very own Patrick Gulo. Thank you, Patrick. And video by Tyler Lapp. Thanks again for watching and or listening. We'll see you again next week.